Um, so hi, everybody. Thank yep. you so much for joining us okay. for today's SEDS Online webinar. Um, my name is Chelsea, and um, I will be uh, with you today. We have Lucy Buck and Charlie Bristow, who are going to present, um, as you can see up on the screen, Chasing Tsunami Deposits with GPR. And um, this is part of Lucy Buck's PhD work. She has a, an MSc in Geophysics from the University of Southampton and um, is now a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at Burbank University with secondary supervision at the IRDR at UC London. Um, so Lucy, we're really excited to hear all about your work. Um, Charlie, thank you for joining us as well. And um, with that, I will give you the mic. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so today we'll be, as the introduction said, we'll be uh, looking at uh, tsunami deposits um, uh, using GPR. This has been my PhD project, so, you know. Oh. Okay, so we will be looking at um, why this is important, uh, what is ground penetrating radar, uh, quick background, to the tsunamis I've been looking at and a previous example of where GPR has been used to look at uh, tsunami deposits um, and what it's shown us through tsunami erosion, uh, 2D and 3D deposit mapping, multiple tsunami deposits, um, miscorrelation of borehole data, um, secondary erosion, prospecting, and then finally uh, some conclusions. Uh, so why do we look at tsunami deposits? Um, as coastal populations uh, increase, uh, economic pressures on the coast also increase, uh, and this leads to an increase in vulnerability to tsunamis. Um, hazard, our current hazard management, at least, is based on knowledge of frequency of magnitude of past events in certain areas. Um, and as a result of this uh, study of deposits of historic and paleo tsunamis is critical to decreasing vulnerability in these coastal communities. Uh, the study of tsunami deposits is relatively recent, um, as tsunamis uh, have only um, are now fully recognised as being of significance for coastal hazard management um, and the influence that they have on coastal geomorphology. Uh, uh, but especially with the um, study of tsunami deposits, it's, it's critical to remember uh, that wave runoff exceeds, exceeds the extent of the sand layer. Uh, so therefore, these studies only give uh, a minimum run up height. Um, and this uh, interest and field of study has really grown in the last sort of 20 odd years since the 2004 uh, Indian Ocean tsunami and the 2011 uh, Japanese Tohoku event. Um, GPR was chosen as it's non-invasive. Hopefully you're seeing a little video of my students in Indonesia doing a GPR survey outside their building. Um, so it's non-invasive um, way to map the deposits. Uh, portable, cheap, you can see how portable it is uh, with potential to provide uh, continuous high resolution images of the shallow subsurface. Uh, for any more information on GPR and its use in sort of sedimentary studies. Uh, Charlie has previously given a SEDS online talk, uh, should be a link in the chat um, about sort of going into more detail about this. Oh, sorry, I'm just running the video again. Uh, so previous examples um, include uh, the Bristow et al study uh, from looking at deposits from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami in Thailand. Um, and the aim here was, again, to use GPR to investigate deposits from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, and the results showed that the tsunami scour had been overlaid by tsunami backwash generated backset beds uh, and beach prograves could be seen immediately seen, uh, seen immediately before and after the tsunami features as can be seen in this GPR data here. Um, uh, so I've been looking at two tsunamis in three areas. Uh, the first, uh, well, the first we'll be looking at which is the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami in Aceh. Uh, and the second would be the Strega slide tsunamis in Northern Scotland and the Shetland Islands. 
Um, and these locations have been select were selected because they have uh, very well documented tsunami deposits. However, GPR surveys had not been performed on these deposits at these locations before. Uh, so I'm sure everyone knows about the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami at 7.58 local time on the 24th of December 2004. Uh, 9.3 earthquake struck the Indian Ocean, uh, 80 kilometers west of the coast of northern uh, Sumatra. Um, Aceh, on the map you can see Aceh, which is one of the areas I, studied, I went to and I studied. Uh, the resulting tsunami was the most devastating tsunami in recorded history, uh, causing almost 300,000 fatalities in over 12 countries. Uh, in Sumatra, uh, the tsunami consisted of three main waves, and there was a maximum wave run up of 51 meters in Loch Nia. Uh, so Indonesia is in Southeast Asia between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. Aceh is the western and northernmost province of Indonesia with a population of uh, over 5 million. Uh, the capital of Ban city of Banda Aceh is on the north coast. Uh, with a population of just over a quarter of a million and a maximum elevation of 35 meters. Um, if you remember, the maximum wave height was 51 meters. Um, and Aceh was the closest point of land, Banda Aceh being the closest city to the center of the earthquake. Uh, Glebra and Malabo, which are the two sites we'll be looking at now, um, were among the worst hits. Uh, 40,000 people died in Malabo. Um, and although the amount of uh, deaths is not known in Glebra, the entire village was uh, completely destroyed. And you can see their proximity to Banda Aceh in the map. Uh, so Malabo, it's 181 kilometers south of Banda Aceh. Um, the study site is on a, a long straight part of the coast. Um, the tsunami damaged all structures, almost all structures. Um, I believe the mosque survived. Um, but mainly the airport, the hospitals, the roads, and the jetties uh, were destroyed. A uh, population of 120,000, uh, killing 40,000, wave heights of 9 to 14 meters, um, reaching up to two and a half kilometers in land. Um, we performed a 93 meter long GPR profile uh, using 200 megahertz antennas here. And at the study site, uh, an erosional ridge could be seen partway along the profile. Um, sort of the pink dotted line on the photo shows where the ridge is. And on the landward side of the ridge, you can see these mature palm trees. On the seaward side, um, these trees aren't present. In the aerial photo, you can see uh, some sort of bushes and trees on the seaward side of this ridge. Uh, and these were planted by the locals as part of um, sort of coastal management. Um, processes. Uh, so if we look at the aerial photos sort of through time, uh, you can see we have before the tsunami, um, the yellow line shows the tsunami erosional limit uh, shown by this erosional ridge. Um, unfortunately, uh, the closest aerial photo to after the tsunami was in 2011. Um, but you can see, but if we take the erosional limit as the um, sort of the maximum amount of beach that was washed away, you can see the rapid regrowth um, over sort of the 15 years since the tsunami. And uh, it's not quite back to the pre-existing coast, but it's, it's almost there. And, and this is the GPR data we found at Malabo. Um, there's a strong tsunami scour that correlates with this, uh, the surface ridge, as we said earlier. Um, a few scour channels uh, below the tsunami scour are believed to be uh, channel features from the nearby river. And we see that immediately after the tsunami, the um, normal beach processes uh, start again and the, the beach um, starts to build up rapidly. Uh, Glebra, uh, further north, it's much closer to Banda Aceh. Um, there are two beaches uh, on this peninsula. Um, we took uh, GPR surveys on, on both beaches. Um, here, the wave height was about 15 meters high. Um, and again, the population is um, un from before is unknown. Uh, uh, the top line, the northernmost line is 25 meters long and used 500 megahertz antennas. And the southern line took, uh, was 50 meters long and used the 200 megahertz antennas. 
And again, if we look at um, aerial photos through time, uh, we see uh, almost complete destruction of the peninsula or the low lying parts of the peninsula. You can see um, <laughs> sort of no buildings afterwards. Uh, here we were lucky to get uh, 2005 satellite images, I think because of the proximity to Banda Aceh. Um, and here again, you can see the rapid recovery uh, post tsunami. Uh, and this is sort of zoomed in on one of our lines, the, the short 25 meter line. And you can see it goes straight over this uh, scour channel caused uh, by the tsunami uh, and that it's completely recovered um, since the event and trees have started to regrow. Uh, and the, the scour channel that can be seen in the aerial photos can also be seen on the GPR data uh, as the blue line. Um, and you can see the beach prograde's truncating against this scour, uh, showing the sort of massive erosion that happened here. And again, uh, the beach prograde's developing above the tsunami scour immediately after um, the tsunami, showing the rapid uh, return to normal processes and the rapid recovery of the beach. However, GPR does have some problems. Um, this is the other line at Glebra. Um, which was taken in this field you can see at the bottom, which has uh, bits of rubble from buildings that were destroyed uh, during the tsunami uh, in it. However, due, due to ground conditions, um, we didn't really get any usable data here for using the GPR, and it shows how important it is to know um, the limits of GPR and um, sort of where it can be used and where there may be issues. Um, because we know there are tsunami deposits in this field, you know, you, you can see them, there's the rubble, we know this field was affected, but it does not show up on the GPR. Uh, in the red box is just some noise um, from a mobile phone or something during the survey. Uh, so then we move on to the Sturega slide, uh, which is uh, the one of the world's largest known submarine landslides. Um, the first Strega slide was the largest of the three events, uh, it collapsed in three parts. Uh, the first Strega slide was the largest, um, occurred about 8,000 years ago, uh, the second 5,000 years ago, and a third approximately 1,500 years ago. Um, and at least this last one was within human habitation of the Shetland Islands and Northern Scotland. Um, Viking invasion of Britain happened about 1,300 years ago. Uh, and no previous GPR surveys of deposits from the Strega slide have been undertaken in the Shetland Islands or in Scotland. Uh, so starting in Scotland, um, deposits from the Strega slide tsunamis have been identified through boreholes along the uh, north coast of Scotland. Uh, there's little to no outcrop sites here, and they're generally found in low-lying coastal fields within rivers and inlets. And we're going to look at uh, Creesh, and Milton Farm. Uh, so Milton Farm is just slightly inland from the town of Wick, which is the largest town north of Northern Inverness. Um, uh, the Wick River leads into uh, the North Sea and yeah, Milton Farm is 2.6 kilometers away from the current coastline and lies in this flat field next to the river at a very low elevation of four meters. Um, above current sea level. Uh, previous boreholes have been taken here by um, Dawson and Smith. Uh, in their paper, the site is referred to as Wick. Uh, we, we've gone with Milton Farm. Uh, the deposit is described here from, uh, sorry, the deposit is described as gray, silty, fine sand embedded within peat um, with a sharp contact between the lower and upper peat. And they found a um, single deposit with a maximum depth of six meters rising to a maximum depth of two meters. And this has been dated to about 7,000 years ago, which in one of the boreholes at least, which corresponds to the first Strega slide tsunami. And um, we completed a 50 meter profile here uh, based on these boreholes um, using 200 megahertz antennas. And now uh, we can see our data here. And uh, the first thing that we see immediately is the GPR actually shows two uh, deposit lines. And if we correlate these two lines with the depths of the deposits found in the boreholes, we found a miscorrelation in the boreholes, um, where the 
the middle, the deposit seen in the middle ball hole correlates to the lower tsunami deposit seen in the two G in the GPR, whereas the tsunami deposit in the two N ball holes correlates to the upper tsunami um, that can be seen in the GPR. Uh, we also see an erosional surface um, below the, the younger tsunami here. Uh, Kreech uh, lies uh, on the north side of the Doorknock Firth and is about 15 kilometers inland from the Moray Firth. Uh, it faces east towards the North Sea and is backed by gently sloping grounds and terrace, ground and terraces. Um, again, boreholes here show um, that there are two marine terraces that make up the eastern part of this embayment and are underlain by, um, again, this light gray clay, um, gray sand and uh, silty fine sand and gravel. And the gray sand layer represents a tsunami deposit uh, that's been dated to six and a half thousand years ago. It's been correlated with the paleo tsunami caused by the second Strega slide. Um, as you can see, a loose grid of 15 profiles was taken over the field here. We won't go through every line, don't worry. Uh, and six boreholes uh, were also taken to sort of help clarify uh, and ground truth the data we saw through the boreholes. Uh, so if we're looking along the line, at uh, along line B, um, <clears throat> we see this really thick uh, tsunami deposit that changes quite rapidly um, in thickness and elevation. Um, the borehole data did confirm that this was this extremely thick, I think up to a metre in some points, a tsunami deposit uh, with a few gravel intrusions, uh, particularly um, at the intersection with Line U where borehole C2 was taken. And across the field, this um, continues. Uh, there's an extremely thick undulating um, tsunami deposit that again changes rapidly with thickness and elevation. And we also see uh, a ridge line further up the deposit. Uh, and this ridge line uh, can be seen in the topography of the, of the area. Uh, you can see in the photo, there's sort of boggy land with this sort of almost channel-like feature uh, that rises above the sort of rises above the rest of the field. Um, however, the changes in topography shown by the tsunami deposit cannot be seen. They're two separate features. Uh, the yellow line is where the slope break is. So this is the southern part is, is more of a hill. Uh, moving on to the Shetland Islands. Um, they are, have been described as an ideal field laboratory for tsunami geoscience research. Uh, and due to the widespread preservation of tsunami sediments within coastal sand layers, um, and the sand layers preserved within peat provide evidence for all three tsunami events related to the straight slide during the Holocene. Um, yeah. Uh, so if we start at, oh, sorry, and we're going to be looking at Whale Firth, uh, Grimister, Scatster, and the Air of Jury, which you can be, you can see on the map. Uh, Whale Firth is uh, a north facing in Little Vaux on the west side of the island of Yale, uh, which is the sort of the middle island in the Shetlands, it's the bit second biggest one, and is generally north-south trending, but has a bend roughly halfway down. Um, and we took a 156 meter long GPR profile located at the end of the bow, furthest away from the sea. And the stratigraphy here is almost entirely peat uh, with overlying glacial deposits. A layer of fine gray, fine to medium sand uh, can be observed within the peat cliffs here. And the, sharp, the sand layer has a sharp base and is poorly sorted, but organic rich. Um, and this varies very rapidly uh, in thickness uh, within the outcrop. Um, it's also of note that the peat below the tsunami deposit is very woody. However, the overlying peat is uh, more sphangum, spang so I probably butchered that, rich. And this sand layer has been dated to uh, about four, four 1,760 years ago and correlated to the second Straker slide. And we took three auger ball holes here as well. Um, so here we managed to trace the tsunami deposit uh, to its furthest extent in land, which um, is sort of about 140 meters or uh, nine meters above the current sea level. Of course, with events in this location and 
uh, in this time frame, you have to take into account uh, sea level rise uh, since the tsunami uh, to include with the, the, the wave height here. Uh, but what was interesting here is at the boreholes. Uh, so if you see the photo, you can see where the, um, the peat outcrops at the beach. And you can see how this changes from very, very thick layer of sand to very thin over very short, very, very small um, areas. And uh, what we found in the boreholes, borehole one, um, the sand was thickest nearest the coast. Um, however, we were able to resolve uh, much thinner layers of sand uh, than would normally be expected. Um, as you can see in the, the layer of sand at borehole two is very, very thin and at borehole three um, is merely a few grains of sand thick. Um, and this is believed to be uh, due to the ideal ground conditions, um, which is sort of surprising in the Shetland Islands. Um, as well as the, the high contrast between the sand and the surrounding peat, making it an ideal target for the GPR. Also, the lack of any other layers um, within. This is the only sort of um, stratigraphy there, so it's easier to, um, for the GPR to pick up. Um, the Air of Jury is a um, single shingle beach uh, located at the southernmost point of the inlet uh, Jury Vaux. Uh, and this is west facing um, on the northeast of mainland, which is the biggest island of uh, the Shetlands. It's where Lerwick and the main airports are located. Um, and the tsunami deposits here have been described um, as one to five centimeters thick with a sharp lower boundary. Uh, again, the sand is fine to medium grained and is intubated, interbedded within peat. Uh, and the deposit here has been traced up to 5.6 meters above the current high tide. Um, uh, and this deposit has been dated to the third, um, so therefore the most recent straight slide. Uh, and here we did a grid survey, uh, seven by 10 meters with lines separated by half a meter uh, using 500 megahertz antennas. Uh, and because of this, we were able to get a 3D um, model rendering of the tsunami deposit. Um, if you see the GPR at the sides, um, so this is all the lines that we took and it's very hard. While there are obvious differences um, in the tsunami deposit between each line, once you um, plot it in a, in a 3D map, it's much easier to see the how um, rapidly the tsunami um, deposit changes over a small area. Um, and how it uh, sort of drapes the pre-existing topography with this almost channel-like feature uh, coming through the middle. And, and if you look at the, um, the photo at the bottom, um, you can see where the tsunami outcrops, uh, again, within the piece, very much at, like whale, uh, where you just have this uh, sort of, well, I was gonna say relatively thick, but thick to thin uh, layer of sand within the peat. Uh, Bastavo is a north, northwest, south, southeast trending funnel shaped inlet, again on the Isle of Yelf. Um, there are up to three tsunami deposits that have been described here. However, only one, uh, which is the youngest uh, and most extensive, has been described ex extensively. Uh, the exposures in the peak cliffs show. Uh, confuse this, sorry. Um, the youngest sand layer has been dated to 13,000 to 15,000 years before current year. And again, this correlates with the, the third tsunami. And uh, a combined 110 meter long profile using 200 megahertz antennas was taken here. Uh, and here we can see the, at least two tsunami events uh, with the, the youngest tsunami, um, Sort of truncating or meeting uh, the older tsunami, um, and that the the two tsunami deposits um, mimic the underlying glacial deposits, even if they don't sort of fully follow the, the shape of the underlying deposits exactly. Uh, and again, we have some noise. Um, there was a large phone antenna sort of here while we took the survey. Um, finally, oh not finally, sorry, second last, right, sorry. Uh, Scatstavo 
is a small inlet on the southern shore of Yale Sound. And this is within Solenvo on the Shetland mainland. Solenvo is the largest inlet in the Shetland Islands. And the Solenvo oil terminal and the um, Skatsta airport are on the, the coast. Uh, you can see them in the photo. And um, the sand layer, again, can be seen within the peats at cuttings and outcrops at the beach. And the layer is six to 10 centimeters thick and consists of a medium coarse grained muddy sand. And the sand layer has been dated uh, three times. Two of these dates are associated with the first Strega slide, uh, one with the second Strega slide. And uh, we did take dating samples, uh, but due to certain recent events, the, the labs have not been as available as one would hope. Um, so we're still waiting on those dates to get back to us. And um, two profiles of 40 meters and 90 meters on over so either side of the road were taken using 200 megahertz antennas. Uh, so this is the shorter profile, which is on the, the coastal side of the road. Uh, and we see the tsunami deposit um, with this almost bite-like shape taken out of it. Um, and this is thought to have been caused by secondary erosion. Uh, so after the tsunami event, um, obviously at an unknown time after the, the tsunami event, and this is likely to be caused either by uh, peat slumping, uh, erosion by the local river channel, or uh, less likely something like anthropogenic uh, activity as peat cutting is um, common in this area. And if we look on the other side of the road, uh, what we see is uh, the tsunami in the GPR, we see the tsunami deposits um, pinching out um, at about uh, 100 and, sorry, 150 meters in land. Uh, however, if we compare this to borehole data, we've actually found the sand um, continues much further inland. However, as it comes inland, it gets closer and closer to the top of the glacial deposits. Um, and at its furthest extent inland, um, the GPR was unable to resolve uh, the, the two separate layers. Um, so I did some modeling on this uh, to sort of see how thick the peat um, or how, um, yeah, <laughs> how um, thick the peat between the sand and the glacial deposits had to be before we um, were unable to resolve the, uh, the sand. And the modeling actually showed a very similar data to the, uh, the GPR that we found in the field. And that's sort of between 10 and 20 centimeters. Um, the sand and the glacial start to uh, resolve as one layer. Um, so again, if this is about knowing the limitations of the GPR, um, because the GPR here shows that the tsunami run-up is actually a lot lower than it is in real life. And the last site is Grimister, um, and this is located part way down Whale Firth. So I said Whale Firth was mainly north-south with the bend in, Grimister is where the bend is. Um, current sea level, there's a small river that goes through this site. Um, and the burn lies at the bottom of this valley, which is mainly boggy ground. Um, and there's no exposures at this location, um, but due to the, the proximity and the no tsunami deposits at Whale, um, this was selected as a potential site for tsunami deposits. We thought we'd see what we could see with the GPR. Um, we took two profiles of 60 and 75 meters uh, using 200 megahertz on either side of the river. And um, we found up to two, well, uh, yeah, two tsunamis in the GPR. Um, you can see with the blue and the purple lines. Um, there's a lot of uh, paleo river channels. Again, there's a, a river running right through this, and this is obviously um, a very movable river. Um, but um, we went back the year after, we took some of the boreholes here, which confirmed that there are two sand, uh, multiple sand layers here that correlate with the, uh, the lines we saw on the GPR. 
So to conclude, uh, GPR has been successfully used to survey and image tsunami deposits. Uh, tracing deposits inland um, gives a better determination of run up height and inundation for uh, paleo tsunamis. Um, multiple tsunami deposits can be identified in a single area. And the interaction between a single tsunami deposit and the underlying stratigraphy, as well as any previous tsunami deposits can be seen. Uh, being able to image tsunami deposits in the subsurface sort of as a continuous line uh, minimizes the miscorrelation of layers. Um, however, care must be taken when the deposit nears another geological layer in the subsurface as the two layers may not be able to be resolved separately. Um, but due to the non-invasive nature of GPR surveys, this method can be used to identify areas that are likely to contain tsunami deposits, but with no outcrops. Um, this makes farmers much happier because you don't have to dig bigger holes in their field. Um, the shape of the tsunami deposit drapes uh, and mimics the shape of the ground it was deposited on. Uh, and missing parts of uh, the deposit show how it has reacted to erosional processes that have happened since the tsunami. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please ask away. Well, thank you very much, Lucy. That was absolutely fantastic and uh, tr truly global. Um, um, oh, wow. I, I was going to say while we're waiting for questions, I have some questions and uh, already we have the first question up there. So I'll read it out very slowly so Lucy can get a breath back and actually have a, have a drink. Um, so for oh, yeah, my throat is dry. <laughs> yeah, it's brutal, isn't it? It's talking. Yeah. Um, Yako Bas in Bangor, in North Wales. Um, very nice case studies. Uh, what are the wider implications of your work for other tsunami deposits, for tsunami deposits elsewhere? Um, huh. So, other tsunamis, so other events in other areas, you mean? Um, one key feature seems to be identifying um, previous tsunamis uh, that weren't known about. So um, I guess, um, oh, words, um, sort of getting a better understanding of the risk of um, tsunamis in other areas, sort of helping to um, sort of build a more complete picture. Uh, another site I visited in Indonesia was this cave um, and through the GPR and borehole um, uh, trench, sorry, you know, we were able to find um, the history there is much more extensive uh, than was believed uh, beforehand. Um, there's also a big implication in coastal recovery after the tsunami events. Um, you know, the beaches sort of are the best protection about the tsunamis and what we found in Indonesia is sort of the very rapid uh, recovery and sort of return sort of back to the normal processes. Uh, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, sorry. Um, I know there's um, possibilities of, I think, looking in the Caribbean and other locations to yeah, sort of build a better picture of the history of tsunamis in certain areas. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, while we wait for more questions, please don't be, don't hesitate. Please do ask uh, Lucy your questions. Um, while, while we're waiting for any more, um, I have a very quick one. I'm sorry if I missed this, but the um, the deposits, and particularly, I mean, obviously you're looking at quite ancient deposits, deposits around the UK or relative ancient. But when we talk about maybe the Atchley deposits, the um, that uh, Boxing Day tsunami. Yeah. What kind of degree of compaction are we talking about over this period, over the last sort of, what is it, 15 years? Over the last 15 years, what kind of degree of compaction? I'm thinking particularly in those organic rich fashions. Do you see much compaction? As, has there been any work done on that? And if there has, how do you think when you go into the longer term stratigraphic record and you're looking at maybe a tsunami deposit from a million years ago, what kind of compaction are we going to be talking about in those deposits? Um. So I'm thinking about this example of this cave in Indonesia. There's, there's a slight debate how many tsunamis, but I think they're talking sort of 12 to 14 events over, oh, the timescales, I think about 2000 years. 
and the tsunami sand is interbedded with what you may call organic matter uh, produced by the bats that also live in the cave. <laughs> and wow. um, yes, yes. Um, as far as I know, no work on compaction has been done there. Um, sort of just thinking of the trenches that I saw while I was there. Um, I think it's fairly minimal, but a cave is not sort of the, obviously the same sort of environment as sort of open coast. So I, I don't know what the comparison be, would be, but that's the only sort of example I can think of. Okay, well, thank you. Um, please, please, everybody, um, do write to your questions, type your questions for Lucy. Um, while we're waiting for um, more questions to come through, uh, if I may, another one. Um, maybe this is a little bit, may, maybe the steg of um, landslides, and we've, we've, yeah. you've had multiple events there with mm -hmm. a periodicity. Uh, has anybody uh, yet approached you from National Geographic or some, some other such wanting to sensationalize this and talk about we're all doomed? Is, is, is this on the cards yet? Uh, no one official. Um, I do get a lot of people, so what are you studying? Oh, tsunamis, where? Oh, in Scotland, and then they start to panic. Um, <laughs> um, no, it's, it's really interesting. And the fact that there have been three major tsunamis in Scotland and Shetland uh, comes as quite a surprise to most people, um, particularly uh, the people living in Shetland and the coastal areas of northern Scotland where we went. Um, it's, I'm, I'm open for interviews, that's all I can say. It has <laughs> really interesting um, events to study and it's, it's a very good conversation starter. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. Oh, we have one, another question. Sophie Book, you mentioned the limits of uh, GPR. What was the main issue you faced with that? Uh, so for this example in Indonesia, uh, Glebra and uh, a few other sites, um, the main issue seems to be the amount of clay uh, within the subsurface. Uh, G, uh, the GPR, the EM waves, um, they don't uh, uh, travel well through clay. Um, also, there's quite uh, a potential of saltwater intrusion within the subsurface. Um, and again, the, the GPR doesn't like uh, the salt water. Whereas if you look at the Shetland Islands where the data is really good, uh, you know, we're talking 100% freshwater intrusion. It is the Shetland Islands after all, um, and it works very well. Um, apart from that, the main issue, you know, the sort of the technological side, um, uh, on a practical side, the Shetlands in Scotland rains quite a lot and it's electronic equipment. <laughs> They don't get on that well, uh, and a few times the, the equipment did break down. But we, we managed to, to find other interesting things to do while we were there. Sure. Terrific. Okay, well, we, have, we now have another question, this time from Jeremy Pyle over in Ipswich um, in England. Uh, hi, uh, Lucy and Charlie. Great talk. In, uh, in areas where there are large or high energy wave events, what is the difference between these and tsunamis? How would you discriminate between them? How can you tell from GPR alone? Uh, this is the storms versus tsunamis argument. Um, you don't, I think, is the short answer. Um, it sort of has to be taken within context. Um, you know, the area in Ache doesn't um, experience hurricanes sort of that would cause an equivalent sized tsunami deposit. Uh, you do get a lot, sorry, an equivalent sized deposit to the tsunami. Uh, you do get large storms uh, in Shetland and in Scotland, well, particularly in Shetland. Um, I think there was a, in the news uh, this winter, there was sort of 35 meter high storm waves off near one of the sites we were. The, the pictures are quite impressive. Um, we do have to take it from context, you know, you correlate the, the dates on the tsunami deposit to the, the, the known dates of the, um, uh, the landslide. Uh, in Indonesia, it's fairly easy because, you know, it's the, the only major thing that's happened and it's in the short time frame. Um, and then there's um, mineral analysis and um, diet analysis of the tsunami deposits. Uh, that's been done fairly extensively uh, in Shetland. Um, yeah, it's sort of 
context clues. It, I, don't, I don't think it can be done by the GPR alone. So it's, it's, it's using that combined science approach. Yeah. Um, picking up on that, if I may, while we're waiting for any more questions, um, the, I mean, I don't know. I know that in Ache, there, there were lots of um, corals and carbonate, let's say critters were brought on shore and yeah. they had very specific um, known depth, depth realms. Um, so the depth to which the tsunami was affecting and transporting material could be calculated. I know that, that happened for Ache. Does anything similar happen in Scotland? Can you, can you, do you see specific depth related fasces that have been transported onto land? I don't know. Uh, yes, within some of the tsunami deposits, um, I believe uh, at Jury, uh, the has been uh, the sand deposit has been um, analysed for the presence of diatoms, which have been correlated to certain to certain depths. Um, I think the the Sue Dawson paper I included, I think, includes this, uh, and that's one way the the theory is that the storms are more surface water, where the tsunamis sort of come from from deeper. Okay, well. Thank you for that. And that one. I, if there are no more questions, I think um, Lucy probably would like a drink. And Lucy, by the way, for everybody that didn't pick up on this from uh, Chelsea's introduction, Lucy's actually submitting tomorrow. So has other things on her mind actually <laughs> presenting here. But I, I really want to again thank you, Lucy. That was a terrific. And, and Charlie, of course, Lucy and Charlie, both of you, but uh, Lucy for presenting. And uh, that was a terrific presentation. I certainly got a lot out of it. And I'm sure others do. And I'm just waiting to see the movie when this, oh. is, when this is picked up. Um, but again, thank you, Lucy. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, I want to just take this opportunity. This is our last webinar of this year. We're actually taking a bit of a break over the next few year, weeks because you may not have noticed we've got BSRG coming up next week. Um, then we have uh, this thing called Christmas and then we have New Year all happening bang, bang, bang. Um, so we're actually going to be taking a few weeks off. Um, uh, while we're doing that, um, be assured that we are working behind the scenes. We already have a very full schedule for next year. We kick off again on the, I have it written down here somewhere. We kick off again on the, <laughs> oh, this is prepared, isn't it? Um, on the 5th of January, we have kick off again on the 5th of January. We have a full programme right through, already booked up right through until the end of April. So please, people, check out the website. All the details of all those webinars are in there. But I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to a group of people here. First of all, I want to thank um, all the helpers behind SEDS Online. There's a team of about 20 people that makes this work. So thank you to all the helpers behind SEDS Online. I want to thank all of our presenters. Without presenters, we'd all be staring at a blank screen here. So it's the people like Lucy that make this work. They put an awful lot of effort in and thank you everybody. But also thank you to the audience. Thank you to the community for all these people who have signed up. We have 1700 people that signed up. Not everybody turns up every week, but people do turn up different people, different weeks, and a lot of people watch our recording. So thank you for everybody for supporting us. Um, we'll be back again, as I said, in the new year. Um, I'm gonna wish everybody a happy festive season. And final good luck to Lucy for tomorrow. Thank for you, session. thank you. And, and you'll, thank you you'll, for inviting you'll... me. It's been, a, <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be part of Sets Online. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll have a very relaxing weekend after this. So there you go. We've uh, so we're getting um, various messages coming through there. So everybody, thank you very much, and I will sign off there. Thank you.